drivers for the population for the population decline um, in southeastern Australia of the woodland birds. So with the extensive habitat fragmentation and 80% um, being cleared, um, unfortunately, what's now left is little islands, which mostly are in like this sea of grassland and croplands. And those islands are quite often located on um, rocky hilltops or other areas that really have low quality soils. So we didn't really think we needed to clear those for agriculture. It wouldn't have been profitable. And that's pretty much the only reason why they're still standing. Um, the problem with that is that woodlands that grow on low quality soil and rocky habitats actually um, have a different composition than the woodlands that you used to be able to find on the really good quality soils on the flats um, or even along riparian areas. Um, are we okay still, Kim? <laughs> yep, we're still going. Okay, good. I'm just. <laughs> Um, so most of the remaining woodlands that we now have in um, New South Wales, especially, but all, all along the East Coast, um, can be found on private property. So within New South Wales itself, 75% of the remaining temperate um, grassy woodland can be found on private property, um, which is why the Birds on Farms property, uh, Birds on Farms project really wanted to work with rural landholders and private landholders because they're the main custodians of these habitats um, and we really wanted to work with them to increase them and protect them. So the original Birds on Farms project started in 1995. Um, that was even before BirdLife Australia existed. Um, at that stage we were still called Birds Australia um, and the project was run from 1995 to 1997. And it included 330 properties that could be found from anywhere in southern Queensland, all the way along the south coast, up into Air Peninsula um, in South Australia. And it included southwestern WA. And there were a few properties even in Tasmania. Um, so 330 properties were surveyed for the bird life. Um, and the reason they started that project was really to find out if all this restoration work um, and the revegetation that people had been undertaking by organizations such as Landcare and Greening Australia was really helping to bring back um, the birds back into those rural landscape. So the question is really, does revegetation actually work? Um, and does, does it bring back our woodland bird community? So that was the original Birds on Farms project. Um, from that, in 1997, we produced a little leaflet, um, which was around managing bird life um, in agricultural areas in a sustainable manner, um, which gave 10 top tips about how you could restore your woodland habitat, um, which was uh, worked really fantastic. A lot of landholders uh, were really pleased that that was developed and we're actually still using it even though it was developed in 1997. We are working on a, a rewrite on that. <laughs> so in 1997, it went quiet because we didn't have enough funding to keep the project going. Um, however, in 2017, we wanted to restart the project um, and we really wanted to focus on the Victorian area because in Victoria um, it's a it's a man manageable sized state um, so we figured that was a, a good place to start um, so we started in 2017 in Victoria and we now have 180 properties that are participating in the monitoring um, and then we started a, a specific sort of targeted project in southern New South Wales in 2019 which is the little blue area um, you can see on the map, um, which is located near Albury. Um, so that project has been running for four, almost five years now, and we have 58 properties that are participating in the monitoring. So overall, that is approximately 240 properties um, that we have there. And the reason we really restarted the, the Birds on Farms project is because we wanted to identify specific habitat characteristics that would be important for specific bird guilds. And I'll explain in a moment what a bird guild is. Um, but really, we wanted to know if you want to bring back honey eaters, for example, what do you need to plant? Do you need to plant specific trees or do you need to have a lot of understory? Do you need to have mistletoe in the area? 
So all those questions, we really wanted to see and, and identify the characteristics of a woodland habitat that would attract certain birds. Um, and also we wanted to halt and reverse the decline of woodland bird populations. Um, and that was specifically targeted with these, um, with the area in southern New South Wales. And I'll get back on that in a second when I explain about my specific project in the ACT. So the survey methodology we've used um, is a pretty standard survey methodology. It's a two hectare, 20 minute bird survey. So that basically means we have a two hectare area of um, a woodland habitat or potentially a grassland habitat, but it's just one specific habitat. Um, it's two hectares, it can be any size. Um, and then people wander around for 20 minutes and they record all the bird species that they see or hear, um, and they do a count of all the birds that they see. So you'll end up with a list that will, for example, say three Australian magpies, one Rufus Whistler and 14 striated formbill. Um, and that is a set technique that we're using across Australia, um, which means that we can compare all the survey sites across the country um, in this project. So in general, um, it does depend a little bit on the property size. We have approximately three to four survey plots per property. Um, and they can represent different habitats, which I'll show you in a second. Um, we do quarterly surveys. So every the surveys happen um, on the season. So we have you know spring, summer, autumn, and winter surveys. Um, and all our surveys get entered into bird data, which is the, the big database that is used by BirdLife Australia. So all the information goes into the same database, um, is done in the same way by all our volunteers. And all our volunteers are experienced bird watchers. Um, and in addition, the data is being checked by the coordinators as well as the people that run our database. So it's a, a lot of checks and balances against that. Like I said, we do look at different habitats, um, and this is specifically to figure out if certain birds prefer other, you know, certain habitats. Um, so we're looking at woodland specifically, so woodland with and without trees. Oh, sorry, with and without revegetation, um, and shrubland with and without revegetation. Um, same with native grassland. Um, we're looking at paddocks with and without trees. So paddocks without trees is just your standard grassland. Paddocks with trees usually incorporate a few scattered um, trees, quite often those really old, um, for example, yellow box that you'll see standing in the, in the paddocks, but they tend to be quite scattered. Um, so within a two hectare area, we might only have 15 trees standing there. Um, then we're looking at restored vegetation, which really is what we're interested in because that's what a lot of people have been doing with land care and greening Australia is bringing back those, those young trees. Um, and then just to round it out, because they contain different types of habitats, um, we're looking at the house because traditionally a lot of people have quite a nice garden around their house, which might attract a lot of um, birds. And then we're also looking at plantations, orchards, and crops, um, even though that eventually we didn't end up with too many of the survey sites in those areas because a lot of people don't appreciate standing in a crop for 20 minutes and only recording one particular one bird that might fly past. It's a little bit boring for most people. Um, so when we analyze the data, um, I won't go into it, into it too deeply, but we looked at a certain um, features that could influence um, why birds occurred on the site. So we looked at some of the environmental variables that we have, like the topography of the site, um, whether there was water present or not, um, the years since a fire went through it, um, and the presence of predators and noisy miners. Um, for the land use, we looked at the grazing regime, you know, how often did they graze and what's the density of the grazing? Uh, do they use irrigation on the site? And were there any restoration activities that people had undertaken? And then for habitat, we counted the number of dead trees. Um, we looked at the trees, how many trees had hollows on the site, uh, how many trees had mistletoe growing on them, um, and like the percentage of cover. So when you're looking up in the sky, how much of the area is covered by um, your canopy? 
um, the type of tree, mid-story, whether there's shrubs present. Um, so we did a lot of different factors um, that, that could influence bird life. And then we looked at the wider, the bigger picture, um, and we looked at patch sizes. So whether a small area, let's say a hectare, contains fewer species than um, a two hectare survey area that might be part of a larger uh, patch. So let's say a two hectare area that might be part of a 20 hectare area, um, which might just support more bird species. Um, and then we also looked at connectivity um, within the landscape. So it was always an assumption that if you are have a lot of habitats that's well connected, birds can travel through it. Um, and so connectivity will have a large influence on how many birds are in the area because little isolated remnants, the birds might not be able to find it and they might not be able to travel towards it. So that's all the factors we looked at. So I know it's a little bit overwhelming um, and I really will only pinpoint the ones that we found uh, a positive or a negative result for. Um, and I'll just sort of ignore all the other ones. So what we did is when we looked at all the species that were observed in our surveys, we divided them into little groups, what we call the bird guilds. So for one, we looked at all the woodland birds that we have in the area. Um, then we divide some of them, you know, some of them can be divided into small birds, um, large birds, so small birds, for example, are the form bills, your pardalotes, your fairy wrens. Um, the large birds are birds like magpies and ravens and currawongs and parrots. Um, then you've got foliage gleaners, so the, the species that really live in the foliage and, and feed on all the, the lerps and the, the caterpillars up there. Um, we looked at migratory or partially migratory species. Um, we had understory specialists, so those are birds like um, your quail thrushes or your button quails. So species that really forage on the ground for the majority of the time. Um, honey eaters, of course, everybody is quite familiar with. Uh, your frugivores, so that's your fruit eaters. Um, so that's really the species that mainly depend on fruit. A lot of those are parrots. Um, then we have bark foraging species such as east um, crested trike tits. Um, we have nest predators which of course are you know, mostly your, your predatory birds, but also your magpies and your currawongs. Um, the ground foragers, your ground nesters. Um, hollow nesters stands for itself. Aerial insectivores are the species that really feed and move around in the air. So we're thinking about welcome swallows, tree martens, um, swifts. So it's a group of birds that hasn't actually been looked at too often. Um, so we really wanted to include those. And then we have a list of introduced species such as um, starlings, house sparrows, um, and common minor, those species. And certain species, of course, like we say, um, let's say a, a, a fairy wren will fall into both the small bird category, but it will also fall into an understory specialist because it mainly feeds on the ground. So it also sits in ground forager. So there's certain species that will fall in multiple categories but it's a way of testing whether those species are influenced by it and you can get quite a, a large group of species. So when we looked at all of that, I guess the biggest um, concern we had is the habitat type. Um, so is revegetation really making a difference? Um, and thankfully I can say it does, um, which is really good. So if you're looking at the, the little graph that you see, you'll notice the mean species is on the y-axis, so it's going up. And on the x-axis, the first one we have is remnant woodland. So everything in this graph is compared against remnant woodlands. So remnant woodlands have approximately 4.7 species. Oh, sorry, 5.5 .5 species. Um, and everything with a star above it means that it's significantly different from the um, remnant woodland. So if we're comparing remnant woodland with restoration, so remnant woodland is all the way on the left, restoration is all the way on the right, you'll see that that's not significantly different. So what that means is we had the same number of species um, of all woodland birds in restoration sites, as well as woodland sites, the remnant woodland. 
So that's really encouraging because it shows us that restoration really does provide habitat for woodland birds. Um, the other thing that we tested is woodland birds, uh, remnant woodlands and restoration plots had more species than a paddock with or without trees. So as you can see, paddocks are the third and the fourth bar on the graph. And you can see they both have a star above them and they're both lower than remnant woodland. So what that really shows is if you start off with a paddock, you have far fewer species than if you had a remnant woodland or a restoration site. Yet if you then conduct restoration, you actually have as many species as a remnant woodland site. So restoration has a significant effect on the number of birds that can use that habitat. Um, so really it does show that all the work that Landcare is doing, all the work that Greening Australia is doing, all the work that your conservation organization is doing has a significant effect on the woodland birds, um, which is really encouraging. And then um, the, the interesting thing that we found is there's two specific habitat types that actually have more species than remnant woodland. One of them is the house plot, which is the second bar. And we think that house plots, there's a lot of people that have beautiful manicured gardens with lots of flowering trees and, and huge variety. They've got a little water bath and they've got food available. So that attracts a huge number of bird species. And that's why we think why house plots have a large amount of birds. The second habitat type that had more birds than remnant woodland is remnant woodland with restoration on top of it. Um, so that's the second to last bar. Um, so the second from the right. And what that shows is that remnant woodland provides a certain type of habitat that species can use. But if you then add restoration, which is quite young, um, it's not developed yet, it has a lot more foliage in a way, it doesn't have quite the characteristics yet, like it doesn't have the big bark the, of, of the stems, it hasn't developed any hollows yet. It it's, provides a different type of habitat um, than the old remnant woodland does. So a different group of birds can use it. And that's why when you add remnant woodland with restoration, you add two different habitats together, which means that more birds can use it. So really shows that if you want to really increase the bird life on your property, restoration is the key. If you can combine it with remnant woodland on the property, um, that's absolutely fantastic because it just opens it up to a bigger group of birds that can use it. Um, so really, yes, restoration within remnant woodlands is the best type of restoration that we can aim for at the moment. Um, then we had a funny one. We looked at the patch size, as I said. So we always expected that smaller areas um, would support fewer birds than larger areas, which is absolutely true. Except if you look at the x-axis, you can see <laughs> that it goes from zero to um, 700,000 hectares to 3 million hectares. Um, as it turned out, we had a few landholders that had properties that were next to um, the Snowy Mountains National Park, um, which cover approximately one seventh, I think, of Victoria um, and 3 million hectares. And it turns out that yes, that particular gentleman had a lot of species. Um, so yes, patch sites, did matter to us, but it's not really a useful um, measure um, because we really wanted to know the difference between, you know, two hectares versus maybe as big as 50 hectares. Um, as it turned out, our, our properties were just too well connected. Um, and so, yes, I figured I'd throw it in uh, just to show that patch size does matter. But um, realistically, when we're looking at just the start of the graph, there's not a big difference between a small property of two hectares and maybe a property of approximately a thousand hectares. Um, you might only find 0.1 of a species more uh, on average. Um, so we really need to dig into that a little bit more. Now, the biggest find and the most interesting one we had is one of the factors that influence the presence of any type of woodland bird 
Um, so every woodland bird together uh, was mistletoe. So the presence of mistletoe um, really made a big difference. And as you can see from the graph, um, we can see that there's in areas where there's no mistletoe, you have approximately five species. And if you go to four to 10 trees that contain mistletoe, you're all of a sudden up to 6.6 .6 species. And if you have more than 10 trees that have mistletoe, you almost hit the seven species. So there's an increase of 36% of species if you have mistletoe on your property on more than 10 trees in that two hectare block. Um, so mistletoe is, is exceptionally important. And what we always thought is mistletoe mostly because it, it flowers a lot and it fruits. So it probably attracts a lot of honey eaters um, and it attracts a lot of fruit eaters. What we found um, is that it's actually ground foragers that have a huge increase when you plant mistletoe. Um, so there were 27% more species um, in areas with mistletoe, so more than four trees with mistletoe, than in areas without mistletoe. Um, as we've now found out, having studied mistletoe more in depth, um, which is done by Charles Sturt University, is that mistletoe is really nutritious. Um, so it has a lot of, like the leaves um, fall off when they still are quite moist. Um, so normally if a eucalypt sheds its leaves, it sucks the moisture out first and then drops the leaf. Mistletoe just drops it with all the moisture in it and with all the nutrients still in it. So all those leaves fall to the ground, which makes really good compost. And it's really good for any type of sort of insect life. Um, it really increases and it just makes it a really good area for insectivores to feed on the ground. So that's one of the I guess most surprising is that even ground foraging birds um, really profit from having mistletoe up in the trees. We did also find um, the similar results for small woodland bird species, as well as species that um, live in the understory, the foliage gleaners, and of course the honey eaters as we expected that really profit from having mistletoe around. Um, so that's one of the, I guess the most surprising things that came out of it is with all the habitat features we tested, mistletoe makes a huge difference. Um, this is a little bit of, of what people would consider an obvious one. Um, we looked at the presence of nest hollows, and then we looked at whether the area, um, if you have more tree hollows, whether you would have more hollow nesting species. It might sound very obvious um, that yes, if you have more hollows, you will have more hollow nesting species. Um, but we need to consider that hollow nesting species, of course, don't always nest. Um, they also just come in to feed and everything else. So other areas could potentially have quite a lot of hollow nesters around. Um, but yes, as it turns out, um, if you have 10 or more trees with hollows in your two hectare area, you double the number of hollow nesting species. Um, and that's very interesting because it, it's also the, the number of species that has increased and not just the number of birds. So for all you knew, it could have been, you know, you have 10 hollows on your property, they can all be glass that make use of it. Um, but as it turns out that no, it's not just glass, it actually, it's a more diverse species composition that you get when you have hollows available. And a lot of that has to do with the size of the hollows, of course. Um, part loads can use the really small hollows. So maybe from trees that are approximately 100 years, they just beginning to develop a hollow, that's part load size. Another 50 years at least will go over that, maybe 100 years before you get sizes that are big enough for cockatoos to use. So a variety of hollows will provide you with a variety of uh, birds. And then the other one we found really interesting is we looked at noisy miners. So the noisy miners are known to be a uh, hyper-aggressive species and they really outcompete a lot of other species and they, they push them out of their territories, they chase them and they can be quite relentless in this. Um, and we've always known it's reducing the number of species um, that are on site if you have noisy miners present. We never knew exactly how much, um, but the government has re recently declared the presence of noisy miners a threatening process for woodland birds. 
Um, so it's now official. We all know noisy miners cause issues. When we looked at our sites and we looked at all the woodland birds that were present, um, we noticed if noisy miners were absent, we had approximately 4.3 species on the site. If noisy miners were present, that reduced drastically to only 3.2 species. Um, so that was a, a huge decrease of about 23%. Um, so noisy miners have a significant effect. Um, and it wasn't just on all woodland bird species, um, but it was also on the small woodland species, your forage gleaners, your honey eaters, uh, migratory species and understory species. Um, so th they have a significant effect on a lot of birds. Um, and what we now know, of course, is the smaller birds are mostly affected by them. Um, the bigger birds can fend for themselves a little bit better. So when you're looking at areas with noisy miners, you're still going to find your magpies, your currawongs, um, your butcher birds, and your parrots. But you're really going to miss out on um, the smaller species like pardalotes, formbills, and fairy wrens because they just get chased relentlessly and they leave the area. Um, so that's sort of what we've encapsulated um, and found in the last couple of years. And we didn't want that information to just go to waste. Um, we didn't just want to write an article about it and you know send it off to some scientists and they were the only ones to read it. We want, really wanted to use that knowledge that we've now gained um, to help landholders restore their properties in a way that they can attract the most species. Um, so we've started a couple of um, what we call sort of satellite projects. Um, the, one of the first ones we started was the one that we refer to um, in the Albury area in southern New South Wales. Um, we now have one in Albury, one in Cowra, um, we have one in the ACT, and we have another one in Yarra TA, which is sort of in the Yarra Valley, just north of Melbourne. And those projects don't only focus on the monitoring of woodland birds, but then we take that next step where we help um, with writing habitat plans for landholders so we can share that information about what we know brings woodland birds back and try and convince landholders that, you know, this is really the way and, and hopefully they'll get into habitat restoration. Um, so our project in the ACT started in September 2022. Um, I am the project coordinator. We also have a project officer, Paul Russell, who is, um, you know, currently watching this. So if you have any questions for them, please feel free. Um, and the area we work in is really almost like a, a triangle with Borowa and Krukwal as the two northern points. And it then goes down into the point encapsulating Canberra. Um, so it includes Borowa and Krukwal, Yes, and Murren Bateman um, and Sutton, so and Gunning um, as the areas. And what we do is we do a lot of community engagement. Um, because we really want to raise awareness of woodland birds, um, specifically that they're declining, because a lot of people don't actually realize that they're declining. Um, you know, quite often they still see them on their property and they think, yeah, that's that's fine. Um, but when you tell them that, for example, hooded robins are declining, they start to think about it and they go like, yes, actually, I haven't seen them in a couple of years and I used to see them a lot when I was a kid. Um, so really raise that awareness. Um, and then, of course, we also tell them how they can be part of the restoration and the conservation of woodland species. Um, and a lot of community engagement goes towards recruitment of landholders for our property and um, birdwatching volunteers. So what we do, we do a, uh, quite a lot of training days um, for our volunteers, um, the birdwatchers as well as the landholders. Um, anybody's welcome. If you want to know more about how to identify birds, please join us. Um, we do workshops on educational topics such as, well, for one, woodland birds, but also habitat restoration techniques, um, the effects of noisy miners on woodland birds, um, and some natural asset management. So really saying, okay, you've got rocky outcrops on your property or you've got a dam, how can you improve that to get more woodland birds back onto your property? Um, the second part of it is we, of course, keep continuing our bird monitoring project. Um, we are slightly different. The ACT project only does two surveys a year. Um, so we do it in spring and autumn. It's when all our migrants are, are moving around. 
Um, so it's the best chance of seeing the most amount of birds. Um, we also do it because a lot of our volunteers are already participating in a lot of bird watching projects in the ACT area. Um, so they're already quite busy. Um, and our next survey that's coming up um, is from the 6th of April till the 21st. Um, so that's coming up in about two months, two, three months. Um, as I said, we do three to four properties or sites per property. Same survey technique. Um, and the surveys can be done by either the landholders if they have enough experience in bird watching, or we can partner them with uh, volunteer bird watchers that can either survey for them or survey with them. Um, quite often we have landholders that are joining the surveys um, or joining the volunteers on the survey days because they would like to know more about the birds on their property. And that's really what we're trying to achieve is to get those landholders really engaged with the birds, learn more about them and really get an affinity with the birds on their property. And once they have that affinity with their birds, um, we start sort of talking about to them about what they could potentially do to help them, the birds. Because quite often, you know, that affinity where you go like, oh, you know, I love looking at dusky wood swallows um, going through the trees. Dusky wood swallows are a threatened species in New South Wales. So finding ways and mentioning that there's ways for them to improve the populations and, and protect these species that they love so much. Um, really helps them convince them that um, habitat restoration is a, is a great option. Um, so when we're talking to them, we, we suggest that we can do a habitat restoration plan for their property. Um, so parts of a few things that people could do um, for a habitat restoration is they can protect the existing woodland um, that they have, the existing remnants. And they can do this by excluding stock, so either just removing stock or um, building a fence around the, the woodland. Um, because as we saw, remnant woodland is really quite important. Um, they can establish new plantings, such as uh, corridors between two existing, prop, um, existing remnants. They can do block planting, so creating something completely new, or they can create stepping stones, um, really helping the birds move through the landscape. So a lot of the the smaller birds, like um, fairy wrens, they don't move further than 50 meters um, across an open area because they are when they are crossing that open area, they're really vulnerable to predation and they're vulnerable to noisy miners. Um, so they need to have stepping stones to be able to move through that landscape. Um, so we need to have vegetation patches for them that are closer than 50 meters together. Um, and that allows them, yes, to move from one area to the next area. Um, we want to introduce shrubs and ground cover um, because what we found is noisy miners um, with the clearing that we've been doing, what we now have as a common habitat is those grassy paddocks with the occasional trees. That is the habitat that noisy miners love. Um, and that is the reason why noisy miners have increased so much in numbers. And that's the reason why noisy miners are such a big problem. And introducing shrubs and making that habitat more complex and denser is something noisy miners don't like. Um, so they will move away and they will go to other areas that you know, are very open um, and what they, where they can dominate. Um, and introducing shrubs will also help the little birds hide from the noisy miners. So it's really a two-sided effect and that's, one of the reasons why we always say introducing shrubs is a perfect way of both increasing the population of woodland birds and decreasing your population of noisy miners. Um, the other two things that we can suggest to sort of recreate the characteristics of old woodland habitats is installing next nest boxes. Um, this really counteracts the fact that a lot of the trees don't have hollows yet because a lot of trees that people have recently planted or even planted more than 50 years ago, they're not quite old enough to have established hollows yet. So installing nest boxes sort of gives the birds an alternative. Um, and reintroducing woody debris, which sounds a bit interesting, but um, for a long, long time, we've all been too precious about our woodland and we've been too clean. We've been cleaning all the woody debris out of our areas because then it looks good and it's easy to drive through, you don't have you know, debris lying around where you have to maneuver around with your machinery. 
but in doing that, we've destroyed quite a bit of habitat, um, really for areas where insects can get to and where certain birds are just specialized in feeding in that woody debris. Um, so for example, brown tree creepers, even though it's a tree creeper, 50% of the time it forages on the ground and it forages on that woody debris where it just prods in the bark and tries to find all the insects. So introducing woody debris again into areas has the chance of bringing back a few more of that, those insectivores that feed on the ground. Um, so with the habitat restoration plans we do, we focus on the greater Yes region and the surrounds. Um, so really our northern part of our um, project area. Um, if a landholder expresses interest, we'll go and do a, a site visit. Um, we'll have a chat with them and, and find out what they want to achieve on their property in the coming years. Um, then we'll make a few suggestions about if they want to in, you know, uh, increase the woodland habitat on their property, what they could potentially do, and make sure that our suggestions could also help them with their productivity. So if they are a productive farmer, a commercial farmer, um, for example, what they can do is um, create windbreaks. Windbreaks are perfect traveling corridors for birds, um, and they create quite a bit of habitat if they're wide enough, but they also provide a great shelter um, for both and shade for stock. Um, and it also prevents drying out of the paddocks that are sheltered by the windbreaks. So there's a lot of I guess mutual benefits that revegetation in your property can have for both your productivity as well as woodland bird communities. And so in consultation with the landholder, we come to an agreement about what type of pro projects he might want to do on his property, either directly or maybe into the future. Um, but we can outline all of them. And every product, um, every project gets described in detail. So every project, we outline the materials that are necessary, how much fencing is required, how many plants are required, and we create a budget for that particular project. Um, and of course, we do, we do it all for free. There's no um, costs attached for the, the landholders other than the time of reading the draft and having that consultation with us. And those habitat plans that are now in detail described about which projects they want to do and we provide the budget, they can use those habitat plans to then apply for financial support to actually do the on-ground implementation. Because what a lot of landholders found is that when there's a funding opportunity that comes around, you maybe hear about it three weeks before, and all of a sudden you have to think about what do I want to do? What could I achieve on my property? How many you know, trees would that require? You know, find how much fencing would I need? And three weeks really isn't enough. Um, so having that habitat plan ready to go means that people can immediately um, apply for that funding. Um, it also means we will give them support. Um, so if we find, for example, a funding opportunity that is for larger organizations, not for individual landholders, we might be able to apply and put a couple of landholders in that application and make sure that we can fund all that on-ground implementation. Um, and it's been in received quite well. Um, we've got at least eight habitat plans that we're currently working on um, or have already completed, um, which is great. And yeah, the project since 2022 has really increased in size. Um, so we started off from scratch because our project had never or our area had never been surveyed. We now have 36 participating project or properties for the monitoring program. Uh, which is fantastic because, you know, your organization um, surveys one of them. Um, and in total, there are 100 survey sites that we're now visiting. And as you can see, there's a, a good scatter across sort of the whole project area. There's a few um, properties that fall outside, but they either have um, their own um, surveyor or they can do the surveys themselves. So we don't have to send a volunteer out to their property for most of those, which is great. And then I've sort of quickly compiled a list of species that we've seen so far. Um, so we've only done two surveys so far. Um, we've had our April survey or yeah, April survey in 2023 and October survey. Um, and now we've got a new one coming up. So in those two surveys, um, we have now observed 103 species across the project area, um, which is absolutely fantastic. It went up 
in the first survey, we had 76 species. Um, and then we did our summer survey and all of a sudden that increased to 103 species that have been observed, um, which really shows you how many summer migrants we actually have that come to our area. Um, we have 15 of our conservation action plan species that have been observed. So those are 15 of the threatened or in serious decline species, um, which is fantastic. It does show you that they're still around in the area, um, you know, and, and really, if we can do a lot of habitat restoration, those 15 species can definitely profit from it. Um, I did have a quick look to see if we get a difference in the number of species observed in remnants and revegetation. Um, so overall, we've observed 76 species in remnant sites. Uh, we now have 71 species in revegetation sites. So really revegetation sites are you know, up there with the remnants. Um, they're doing really well. And if we look at the average of species observed per survey, um, there really isn't the difference. Uh, it's remnants have the same number of species as revegetation sites. This is, of course, very preliminary with only two surveys done, um, but it's fantastic to see that revegetation is doing so well. Um, when I looked at the type of species that use remnant habitat versus revegetation, um, four species really stood out for being a remnant specialist. Um, so we had eastern shrike tit, white-throated tree creeper, spotted quill, fresh and painted button quill that almost solely occurred in remnant areas, um, which can really be explained because eastern shrike tits feed on the bark. So they, they strip the bark of trees and look for the insects. So you really need a tree that's already at least 30 years old to start developing those flaky barks. Um, so yes, it requires a, an older tree. The same for the white-throated tree creeper. It's specialized in hopping along up the, the trunk of a tree. And of course, you know, this, the smaller revegetation or the younger revegetation areas just don't have those established tree trunks yet. Um, so again, they have to wait until they're a bit older. Um, and the same is spotted quill thrush and painted button quill. They really like to rummage through leaf litter. Um, and they they really do well when there's a, a really deep layer of leaf litter and a couple of understory shrubs. And what we find is that um, revegetation areas, if they're too young, they just don't produce that leaf litter layer yet. So again, it's a bird that you will only find in um, in remnant areas. So even though you know remnant and revegetation sort of shows you that there's the same number of species, the the consistency of species is slightly different. Um, but the older the revegetation will get, the more it will look like remnant vegetation and the more of the remnant species can use it. So yes, that's um, that's our project. Um, and basically all the, you know, the findings that we've had from um, our birds on farms project so far, we still, of course, keep analyzing it. And um, this was our, our data up until 2021. Um, so we've been going for an additional two and a half years by now. Um, so yeah. we're really looking forward to, to learning more and more about what really attracts the bird life to revegetation areas. So yes, um, if anybody has any questions, I'm, I'm sure Kim can facilitate. We have any questions? If not, I'm not bad. I don't know. 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 I'm sorry. Uh, That's all right. So we, uh, what we found is that little bird nuts are doing well and big birds are doing well. But there's some insights with the birds between 20 and 40 grams. So it's a big hunting in the whistlers and uh, robins, all those sort of species. 
are on under the decrease. I wonder if you have found anything like that in your in your study. Um, a lot of the birds that we found that are listed as threatened or in decline, you're right, are about the mid-sized species. Um, so I think we have four, uh, five or six robin species that are listed as declining. Um, two of the tree creepers, we've got the two babblers. Um, so yes, a lot of the mid-story or mid-sized species. Um, one of the reasons we think that might be influenced is because they are all quite reliant on understory and old habitat. So um, robins, for example, they they need um, shrubs to sit on and to perch on because they 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 are pounce feeders. Um, so they need to sit on low twigs or um, fences sometimes or shrubs where they can survey the ground and look for insects to pounce on. Um, and we've really destroyed all that type of habitat. Um, a lot of the, even the remnant woodlands don't have any shrub layer anymore. Um, so that's really why those species are decreasing, um, as well as, for example, the babblers um, and the tree creepers is because, again, that remnant, they require remnant woodland. Um, and it's just so low um, in quantity at the moment. There's just not that much around. Um, while a lot of the smaller species, I'm guessing, you know, the form bills, the pardalotes, um, they all feed in the canopy. And that's that's still there because we still have some tree standing, but we just don't have that understory. Um, so it's really the the birds that are relying on shrub layers and, and mid-story layers that have disappeared out of the landscape. Well, is anybody out there in Zoom land? I can, I can see Paul Russell. Uh, your co give away, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, do you want to add anything to uh, what Margot no. has said? No, I think Margot's covered it very well, as as always. <laughs> Great. That's just flattery. <laughs> she is my boss. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anybody else out there in Zoom land asking a question? Um, Janine. Hi, Margo. Um, I'm quite interested in your um, comment about next nest boxes. Mm -hmm. um, what sort of results have you actually observed or seen as to their success? Some other people we've had have suggested that they're not particularly um, effective and have to be very specific for each yep. species. Yeah. Um, yes. We we have found the same thing. Um, so nest boxes, um, we always say only put a nest box up if you're targeting certain species um, and then make sure that the nest box fits the dimensions that the species requires as well as the height where you hang it. Um, because otherwise you're just getting, you know, your starlings or common species like galahs and, and rosellas using these nest boxes. Um, yeah, you really need to have um, species specific nest boxes. And also it tends to only work if the species is already in your area. Um, because quite often what we're targeting is, for example, superb parrots or brown tree creepers. Um, if a brown tree creeper doesn't live in that habitat patch, he's not just gonna fly in. Um, so realistically, what we can do is try to increase the colony by providing more um, nesting areas. Um, and it's the same with superb parrots. Superb parrots go back to colonies they know. Um, so putting nest boxes up potentially in colonies where they're already breeding could be positive. Um, unfortunately, they haven't found a nest box that works yet for superb parrots. Um, so we're basically saying, if you're targeting superb parrots, just please hold on and wait until they find a nest box that works. Because um, otherwise, yes, you're just 
I guess you're, you're just providing it for common species and they just get more and more common. Um, if that's what you're after, that's great. Um, if you would like to have glass breeding around your area, please do provide a nest box. But if you're targeting certain like specific species in the climb, um, it really only works in areas where you know the species occurs. Um, and yes, having that species specific nest box with the right hollow size. Um, so there's a few nest boxes now that are being designed specifically towards them. Um, but yes, your, your general nest box that you buy at Bunnings is not going to do the trick. Mm. They also do require quite a bit of uh, attention afterwards. So if you hang one up, you do have to check and clean it every year to make sure it still works and functions well, because you know most of them are made of wood and eventually it rots away. So yeah, maintenance is a big thing. Hmm. Looks like we've run out of questions. Thank you so much, That's Mara, all right. for your uh, presentation tonight. It's hugely comprehensive, lots of data. Uh, it's obviously well, well run and um, uh, makes no mistakes. Uh, it um, produces great results. You're able to back up everything that's uh, uh, produced and it's uh, fantastic to see. It uh, obviously comes from your passion for birds. Yes. In a way. That comes through very obviously <laughs> after touring cats and other uh, species around the Australia. You've uh, come back to where it's, um, you, you love it. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much for tuning in. I apologise for some of the technical difficulties we've had That's and to right. our audience out there, um, but we hope we'll get it. Uh, get it right next time. We'd love to see you um, for, in a few years' time talking about more results from your projects. Yes, yeah. That would and be wonderful. Can, can I just say thank you all very much because I know, you know, you've done a lot of revegetation work also in my project area um, with Vince Heffernan's property and you're all, you're surveying his property as well. Um, we really couldn't do it without our volunteers and with people like you who are recreating that habitat. So thank you very much. Thank you, Marco. Okay, thanks very much. And all right, thank you. And um, I'll, I'll tune out. <laughs> You're welcome to stay around and listen to the rest of it, but I'm thank sure you. you've got to. Uh, yeah, we can't quite hear it um, online. There's too much noise yeah. going through. <laughs> Thank you. We'll All see right. you next time. See ya. Okay. okay. Stop the recording. Let me stop the recording.